Live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to our exclusive coverage from theCUBE here in Austin, Texas. We're live on the floor at CloudNativeCon and KubeCon, KubeCon, like KubernetesCon, not the KubeCon, us, uh, but <laughs> KubeCon. We have Michelle Norelli, who's the Senior software engineer at Microsoft, also the co-chair with Kelsey Hightower, great event. Record setting attendance, I'm John Furrier, your host with Stu Miniman. Michelle, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much for having me. So, people don't know, but they might have watched the stream. If you had a stream, you were on stage keynoting and managing the whole program here. Congratulations. Thank you. More attendees here at this event than all the other CUBE cons and Cloud Native combined. Yeah. Shows the growth and interest in a new way to develop, new way to engage with other developers and yeah. create value. Yeah. And Kubernetes has been the heart of it. Explain, Cloud Native Con and KubeCon, what's the difference? Because I love Cloud Native, but what's this Kubernetes thing? I love that too. Yeah. How does it relate? Are they intertwined? Yeah. Explain, take a minute to explain. There's a, there's a really big Kubernetes audience and community, and they need time to engage uh, and just like work with each other and learn from each other, and that's where KubeCon came from. So KubeCon was the original conference, um, and the first one was in November in Seattle in 2016. And I was actually at that one. It was a few hundred people, uh, and it was just so small. People were actually asking like, what is a pod? What is Kubernetes? Which are fine questions to ask today as well. But it was, everyone was asking this question. Nobody was past that point. And then, um, you know, Kubernetes was donated to uh, the CNCF, and there were also these other uh, cloud native projects that came about in the space. And so we wanted a conference that encompasses both all of the cloud native projects as well as serves the uh, Kubernetes community as well. So that's where both of them came from. Um, some of the other cloud native projects have their own conferences, like Prometheus has PromCon, um, and that's been growing as well. I think the last one was 200 people, up from 70 the last time. So I got to ask you, because we've been covering us, we were there at the KubeCon, I was actually yeah having drinks with Lou Tucker, JJ, when like, hey, we should do this Kubernetes thing and bolt it on to the Linux Foundation. So yeah. we've been present at creation with the whole team. It's been fun to watch. Wow, yeah. But it's the tale of two stories in the community, yeah. in the industry. Fun, companies that got funded and were building open source and our participants who were building projects out and then a new onboarding of new developers coming into the community. A lot of first timers here. Yeah. They're seeing a visibility into the success of cloud yeah. and they're eager to engage. So you got a lot of folks who have invested into the community and new entrants, a migration into the community. Yeah. What does that dynamic mean to, to the CNCF? How is that impacting how you structure the programming? And what, what are some of the insiders talking about? What, yeah. how does this, what's the reality? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, this is a really positive community and uh, there are just like so many people working together and collaborating, not just because they, I mean, it's, it's nice to be in a positive community, right? But you kind of have to. Like, these problems are really hard and it's good to learn from different organizations have, that have like come across these uh, projects. Um, or problems, sorry, in the in the space before, and they'll come and collaborate. I think um, some of the things that we've been talking about inside the community is how to actually, how to onboard people. Um, so the Kubernetes community is starting up a new mentorship program to help people uh, that are new to the community start learning how to review code and then PR code and and be a part, productive members in the community in whatever they whatever area they want to be in. Yeah. Michelle. Uh, I want to hear about kind of some of the breadth and depth of the community here. Yeah. You know, we went through so many announcements, there's a bunch of 1.0s, yeah. there's a bunch of brand new projects. Yeah. I think what it was four projects a year ago and it's mm -hmm. now 14. You know, right, how, how does somebody supposed to get their arms around it? Should they be, be, be yeah. thinking about that? You know, wh where should somebody start? You know, what, what, what do you recommend? Yeah. yeah, start with the, that's a great question by the way. Um, I think that people should start with, the, with a solution to a problem they already have. So just know that people have run into these problems before and you should just go into the thing that you know about first. And then if that leads you to a different problem and there's a solution that the CNCF you know, has already come across, then you can go into and dive into other problems. For example, um, I am really interested in Kubernetes and have been in that space, um, but I think tracing is really interesting too, and I want to start learning how to incorporate that into my workflow as well. 
so. Yeah. Yeah. So, Michelle, you, you're also one of the diversity chairs yeah. uh, for the event. Can you talk about kind of the diverse global nature of this community? Yeah, we are uh, spread across all time zones. So I actually want to share an experience I have uh, as a SIG lead um, in Kubernetes. So at first I really wanted to serve all of the time zones. And so we have these weekly SIG meetings at 9.30 a.m. Pacific. And I was like, no, maybe we should have like alternate meetings, like alternate weekly meetings uh, for other time zones. Um, but after talking to those, the people in the other time zones, like um, that are very far off actually, like China, Asia Pacific, um, I realized that they're actually more interested in reading notes and watching videos, which is something I didn't actually know. You know, it's, it's, you think like, oh, you have to serve every community in the same way, but what I've learned. Like face to face. Yeah, face to face, exactly. And that's not actually how, uh, that's not how actually everybody wants to interact. And so that's been an interesting thing I've learned uh, from the diverse nature in this, uh, in this space. What's the uh, challenges? I mean, we've been talking, we were just at reInvent last week at Amazon, obviously the, the number of services that they're rolling out is pretty strong, they're the leader in the cloud, but as multi-cloud becomes the choice for most, most enterprises and businesses, the service requirements, the baseline, has got to be established. Seeing your community rolling out a lot of great new services, um, but storage, old storage, is transferring to machine learning and AI, and, you got IOT right around the corner, so you have new, new kinds of applications. Yeah. Okay, it's changing the game on the old guard. Storage and security, obviously two important areas, you got to store the data. Yeah. Data is at the card of the value proposition. Yeah. And then security, security. How are you guys uh, dealing with that, those challenges? Those, those, those are political grounds that people are, have a lot of, make a lot of money in. I mean, yeah. old storage, I mean, ship a storage drive and here's an architecture. Those yeah. are being disrupted. Yeah. I think they, I mean, they'll continue to be disrupted. I think people are just going to bring in new and new, more and new and new use cases, and then uh, people will come and meet them, uh, meet those customers where they are, and people just have to change, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Shift or die. Yeah, um, I think that's some, that, that we are getting to that point, but I can't, only time will tell. We'll see. What are some of the exciting things that you see from the new developers? I've recognized some friends here that I haven't, that, that aren't wanting in the community or new, and they're kind of like licking their chops, like wow, what a lot of excitement. I could build value, and I could have a distribution, I got a community, and I can make money. And then, yeah. you know, Dan said, you know, project, products, profits. Yeah. They put the product, profit motive right on the table, but he's clear to say not pay to play. It's okay to have profits if you have a good product yeah. from a project. Yeah. I buy that. But the new developers like that because it's an end scoreboard. What are you guys doing with that new community? What's the vibe there um, around those kinds of opportunities. Are you guys creating any programs for them or? Yeah, um, I think just to, just they can get involved, you know. I think knowledge is power, perspective is power also. Um, so being involved uh, helps give you a perspective to see where those gaps are and then come up with those services that are profitable or those tools that are profitable. And I think this space can be very lucrative based on the yeah, number, of logos. number of people was it here. 40, uh, sponsors, I think he said. He said. Yeah, yeah, Michelle, I was wondering if you, you can comment when you're building the schedule. How do you balance, you know, all those platinum sponsors versus, you know, some of the, you know, practitioner companies that are also getting involved? How, how do you look at that? Yeah, there are there are different levels of sponsorship, right? Like you mentioned, um, the events team has a sponsorship section or sponsorship team, and they handle most of placing sponsors and all of that. Um, and so they'll get whatever level. Uh, they want. But actually, Kelsey and I do a lot of research into like what's happening in the community, what's interesting, what's new, um, and and we'll find time to highlight that as well. So, lots role, of research. What's your role at Microsoft? Share with the audience what you're working on, what's your day-to-day -day job? Is yeah. it just foundation work? Are you doing coding? What are you coding? Yeah. What's your favorite? Is it VI, Emacs? What do you prefer? <laughs> I mean, share That's some. awesome. Yeah, so my, my uh, work is 30% community and 70% engineering. I really love engineering, but I also really love the community and just getting these opportunities to give back, um, you know, build skills as well, learning how to speak in front of people um, as well. These are valuable skills to learn and it gives me an opportunity to just give back what I've learned, so um, I appreciate those. But I mostly work on developer tools that are open source um, that help people use containers and Kubernetes a little more easily. Uh, so I work on projects like Helm, Draft, and Brigade. 
Um, and these are just like things that we've seen, the pain points that we've um, experienced, and we want to kind of share our solutions with them. So Draft is the one I've been working on a lot. Uh, have you heard of Draft? No. Okay, um, let me give you the two second thing. Draft is a uh, tool for application developers to build containerized apps without really understanding or having to understand all of what is Kubernetes and containers. So yeah. that's my so, favorite space to be Michelle, in. Michelle, you know, one of the things we look at coming in here is there's that balance between there's complexity, but there's flexibility. Uh, you know, I, I've heard Kelsey talking about yeah. this a lot. Uh, when I talk to customers, they're like, oh, I love Kubernetes because I take Vault and I take Envoy and I take all these yeah. different things and put it together and it does what I want. But a lot of people are daunted and they say, oh, I want to I want to just go to Microsoft Azure and they'll take care of that. Yeah. So how do you look at that and, and what, 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 what is the balance that we should be looking for as an industry? Yeah, we, we've been um, emphasizing in the community a lot on pluggability across projects. It's like a theme that I think almost every project hits and a word that you'll hear a lot, I'm sure you already have heard a lot. Um, and I think that's because you can't meet everyone's needs, so you build this modular component that does one thing very well and then you learn how to extend it. And, or you give people the ability to extend it. And so that's really great for scaling a project. Um, I, I do really appreciate the clouds coming out, all of them, um, with their own managed services because it's hard to operate and understand all of these things. It's, it takes a lot of depth and, and knowledge, context, and just prior experience. And so I think that'll just make it a lot easier pe for people to onboard onto these technologies. I was going to sure. ask you, I was going to ask you, you brought up pluggability. Yeah. So we saw you know, Netflix on stage, which is phenomenal, love the culture, yeah. track dynamic. I think that's Same. a super important conversation. You know, something we've been talking about, style change is a real part of what we're seeing tech being a part of. Um, but the, the things that popped out at me in the keynote were service mesh and pluggable architecture. So I want to yeah. get your thoughts. For the folks that aren't that in the trenches and inside the ropes, what is a pluggable architecture and what is a service mesh these days? <laughs> because you got Lyft and Uber and all these great companies who have built hyperscale and large scale systems in open source and now are big tech success stories yeah. donating these kinds of approaches. Pluggable architectures and service mesh. Take okay. a minute to explain. So, pluggable architectures. Um, this is when you have one layer of your, there's a piece of software that does something, does one thing very well. Um, but, you know, every, I like to say that every company is a snowflake, and that's okay. And so you may have some workflow or need that is specific to your company, and so we shouldn't limit you um, to just what we think is the right solution to a problem. We should allow you to extend uh, or extend these pieces of software with modular components or just extensible components that, that uh, work for you. Does that make a little bit more yeah. sense, yeah? yeah. Um, I work on Helm and we also uh, uh, have a pluggable architecture um, because we were just getting so many requests from the community and it didn't make uh, sense to put everything in the core code base. If we did, if we accepted one thing, it would really um, uh, just interrupt somebody else's workflow. So that that's helped us a lot. In in my personal experience, I really like uh, pluggable architecture. So that means you can go build a really kick butt app, yeah, nail it down to your yeah. specifications, but decouple it from a core or avoiding kind of the old spaghetti code mindset, but kind of creating yeah. a model where it can be leveraged. Yeah, Is that right? exactly. Right, plug in. We yeah. all know what plugins are, but right. so so that someone else could take advantage of it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Service mesh. So okay. there's kind of that's evolved. Yeah. We heard a lot of that. What is that? These yeah. Days? It's um. So developers. Uh, this is actually. The Lyft story is really interesting to me. So at Lyft, um, developers were really uneasy about moving from the monolith to the microservices architecture uh, just because they didn't really understand um, the network component and where like uh, network reliability would not be so reliable, <laughs> would fail. <laughs> and um, and most so of the time. <laughs> uh, service meshes have allowed um, engineers at Lyft to understand where their failures happen in, in terms of, like, of, a, of a network standpoint. And so you're basically abstracting like, the network layer um, and allowing more transparency into it. This is like very useful for when you have lots of microservices and uh, you want this kind of reliability and stability. Awesome. So 1.9 is coming, it's going to support Windows. That's a key announcement, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. Um, just going to the next level, I mean, growth. Talk about the growth, because it's fun for us to watch. Uh, you know, 
kind of a small group core, young community, less than three yeah. years old, yeah. really two. Kubernetes right. kind of had some traction, but it really is going to be commoditized, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah. So how do you, what's, what's your take on this? What's the vibe? What's the, what's the current feeling inside the community right now? Uh, Excited, you know, pinching ourselves? I yeah, mean, no, I think know. everybody's in awe. Everybody is in awe, and we're just like, we want to make this the best experience possible in terms of an open source experience. You know, we want to welcome people to the community, we want to serve people's needs, and uh, we just, we just want to do a good job because this is really fun, and I think the people working on these problems are having a lot of fun with, uh, with seeing this kind of growth and support. It's been great, certainly for us, present and creation, present and creation of this whole movement. It's been fun to watch yeah. and document. Um, final question, what should people expect this week? What is the show going to hopefully do? What's your uh, prediction? What's your uh, purpose here? What should people expect this week? And for the folks that didn't make it, what did they miss? Okay, there are so many things happening. It's insane, you're going to get a little bit of everything. There's lots of different tracks, lots of diverse content. Um, I think I'm, when I go to conferences, uh, in my personal experience, I really love technical salons. Those are really great because you can get your hands dirty and you can get questions answered by the people who created the project. That's an experience that is, is really powerful for me. I went to the first open tracing salon, and that's where I kind of got my hands dirty with um, uh, tracing, and Ben Siegelman, who's doing the keynote today, this afternoon, was the person who was teaching me how to like do this stuff, so. Yeah, how it cool was, is that? Yeah, it was awesome. It's not like some marketing fluff pitch. No, it was, it's not, and it's just like, it's, it's real experienced, uh, very um, expert, Ex, like experts, you know, in the in the space, teaching you these things. So that that definitely can't be replicated. I think um, the SIG sessions will be really cool. There's a big focus on not just learning stuff, but also collaborating um, and and just talking about things before they get documented. So that's a really good experience here. And too. it's an action-packed schedule. I tweeted that. It feels like a yeah. you know you know when Burning Man had like a hundred people and yeah. now it's this big thing. I think this is the beginning of an amazing industry. People are cool. Yeah. They're helpful. Yeah. They're getting they're getting involved, answering questions. Mm -hmm. Open book here. Yeah. At Cloud Native Con, you've got thanks, Michelle Thank Norelli, so for coming on. Co-chair, senior engineer at Microsoft. Great to have her on the cube. Great keynote. Uh, great color. Great fun. Exciting times here at Cloud Native Con. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE Media, with Stu Miniman, my co-host. More live coverage after this short break. <laughs>